I'll now call the February 11, 2020 regular meeting of the Board of Supervisors to order. Uh, will the clerk please call the roll? Supervisor Leopold? Here. Friend? Here. Coonerty? Here. McPherson? Here. Chair Caput? Here. And if we can have a moment of uh, prayer or silent uh, con uh, reflection, and then we'll follow with the board, uh, Pledge of Allegiance. Mr. Palacios, uh, are there any late items or changes to the agenda? Yes, there's a, an addenda to the consent agenda. This is item number 57. It's to ratify the approval of an authorization to sign a memorandum of understanding between the County of Santa Cruz and the cities of Capitola, Santa Cruz, Scotts Valley, and Watsonville regarding Senate Bill 743, analysis and tool development and adopt resolution accepting unanticipated revenue in the amount of $45,491 from the four cities for implementation of SB 743 relating to transportation impacts of CEQA requirements as recommended by the planning director. That concludes the additions to the agenda. Okay. And uh, do any board members uh, wish to pull any consent items or make a comment? None. I, I don't want to pull one, but I thought we usually do the comments after we hear from the That'll public. That'll be fine. Okay. Let's hear from the public. Yeah. And uh, public comment. Now is the opportunity for members of the public to address the board on any topics on today's agenda, the consent items, closed session, and topics that are not on the agenda, uh, but are within the jurisdiction of our board. If you cannot stay later to speak on regular agenda items, you may address those items at this time. Uh, how many uh, uh, plan to speak at this moment? Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll give you three minutes, and uh, if you can do it shorter, that'll be fine. Okay, thank you. Gary Richard Arnold, Chairman Supervisors. Um, I think people are unaware of a political <laughs> machine, and that's a Panetta political machine. Um, we see that the Bernie Sanders people, uh, what happened in Ohio, and just a, you know, with a couple 400,000 votes, are getting a taste of it the second time. Leon Panetta was head of the CIA in the Department of Defense. Um, he also gave military and policy information to a Chinese communist espionage agent, which his board of supervisors maintains two plaques in the courthouse there to slap in the face to the uh, judges. But I see that the same people, uh, this machine, they endorse each other. Um, two members of this board had threatened the Grange. Um, they're uh, both persons and their, pers and their, pri pri and their private property. Um, this has been reported both to the sheriff and to the district attorney. They have not acted on it. And again, they're all endorsing each other. Um, the, that person, that Soviet espionage agent, uh, was uh, ultimately uh, responsible for taking over not only the Democratic Party, but recently the uh, uh, Republican Party through uh, his, uh, his offspring here. Uh, he was reported as a communist enforcer, both by the state of Washington, the state of California, and he's mentioned 22 times uh, by the federal government as a, a communist uh, a spy. Um, Leon Panetta gave gave him an award. Uh, Gary Patton, a number of other people in the Panetta machine attended uh, uh, an honorarium. He's been blessed in the congressional record by Leon Panetta. Leon Panetta has the most powerful lobby in the West. Again, he was head of the CIA and DOD. And this threats that come from uh, several supervisors over here on my right uh, is typical of Hugh DeLacy that threatened Democratic state legislatures in 
in the state of Washington. They are creating a parallel government um, that contains nine cities and three counties. The last time I went, I was the only person of the public from all of those counties. And at that time, the chairman, uh, Greg Caput, uh, voted for Bruce McPherson, who just happened to receive tens of thousands of dollars from a Chinese communist triple spy on the front page of U.S. News and World Report. Um, Hugh DeLacy is mentioned in scores of books by the head of the intelligence for uh, General MacArthur. If you had anybody killed in uh, World War II, the Korean War, or Vietnam, these, this person is responsible for part of that with cooperating with the sword spy ring, um, Perlo, where, and also, the good times uh, genesis uh, comes from James Weinstein, who used to drive around the Soviet atomic spies uh, that were put to death. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi. Okay. Good morning, supervisors. My name is Primavera Hernandez, and I oversee the county's Healthy Smiles Oral Health Program based in Health Services Agency Public Health Department Division. I'd like to thank the board for supporting children's oral health through the proclamation that February is National Children's Dental Health Month. Tooth decay is the most common disease in children. One in four children in Santa Cruz have dental cavities. The great news is that cavities are preventable. In Santa Cruz County, we are fortunate to have the Oral Health Access Steering Committee that is made up of local community organizations, medical and dental clinics, such as Dientes Community Dental and Salud Para La Gente. Oral Health Access Steering Committee believes that everyone deserves a healthy smile. And it works collabor collaboratively to promote and expand affordable oral health care for the whole community, especially children. Thank you so much for supporting children's dental health. Thank you. morning. My name is Tony Crane here uh, objecting once again uh, to the implementation of the second story program in our Aptos community. Uh, I've been objecting to the implementation of this program in our neighborhood for about two and a half years now. I've studied all the laws that you claim make it legal. And I'm very clear that you and county council who is feeding you this information are flat wrong. And I think you all know it. I've provided information to all of you. Uh, they're doing that by substituting words within the law that aren't there to justify what they're doing. That is prohibited. That is against the main tenets of law. Uh, I'm also clear that laws were broken in the impl implementation of this program and that your refusal to honor your oath uh, to uphold the laws makes you complicit. Um, you've refused to see the evidence we have that people lied, committed fraud, took public funds to do something they knew they couldn't do, and that's been presented to you and it's very clear. Now we received a different legal interpretation from the planning department uh, that is even more absurd, claiming some housing program uh, that it falls under, which this is not a housing program. Um, I delivered that letter to your office yesterday. Uh, it is the letter of, of appeal to the county for this uh, denial to investigate. And that appeal was turned away. They wouldn't even accept it uh, because of some rule that I, I can't find is actually real. Uh, my question now is, are you guys simply incompetent or are you corrupt? Well. Um, that's a false choice because uh, once you decided to ignore the fraud and other laws that were broken and, and just the lies and the, the lack of ethics that occurred in the implementation of this program, you made a decision. And once you realized that and saw this and you chose to stand behind this in originally incompetent decision that you made because it's a personally untenable situation, it automatically becomes corruption. Once you do something and you do it for a personal reason, then it's corrupt. And I can't see why you guys aren't seeing what I'm seeing and, and th just the basics of the lies that were told 
and you're not doing anything about it. And in that, I see incompetence, but then two and a half years later, it's corruption. It's clear and simple, and it's across the entire county government, planning department, et cetera. Thank you. Good morning, gentlemen. My name is Ken Painter. I'm on the 2019-20 uh, civil grand jury. Uh, I got selected to accept the proclamation because I'm the only one that owns a coat and tie. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you for the proclamation. Uh, it is, right now is a time when we're looking for applicants for the 2020-2021 grand jury. Uh, those can be found on the uh, county website. Uh, what our task is, is to make local agencies and districts more efficient and effective through investigations. Uh, you serve a one-year uh, service. Uh, you're giving back to the community. Uh, and uh, it's pretty rewarding. It requires a lot of time, a lot of hard work. So if you don't want to do that, I would not submit an application. Uh, but you have a whole host of uh, very emotionally connected people in the audience that uh, you know, feel very strongly for our community and, and hopefully one or two of them would submit an application. So thank you for the uh, proclamation. I think your microphone's not on. Uh, will you be able to stick around for the Mental Health Advisory Board? Uh, I was not aware of that. Was there a, a specific it's number, purpose? It's number eight, and the only reason I'm mentioning it to you, uh, the civil grand jury uh, looked into uh, how it was run and everything about three years ago, and now uh, everything hopefully has been fixed uh, according to the grand jury. Okay. So. Sure. Okay. That'll probably be in about 20 minutes or okay. so. Okay. Okay. Thank Thanks. You. Hello, my name is Fallon. Thank you for being here and thank you for allowing me to speak about my journey in a Santa Cruz program. When I first got to Gemma, I was coming out of jail and I was very lost and broken. Gemma has helped me work through my problems. Gemma is designed to support us financially until we are ready to support ourselves. That allowed me to find a career that I truly love to do. I am a caregiver and I feel very rewarded when I help people. Another great thing that Gemma does to support us is they save money. They saved money for me so when I graduate, I have money to support myself. In the 18 months that I was there, I was able to save $5,000. Also, the rent that we pay is based off our income so that helps us tremendously. Because of the classes provided by Gemma, I have learned coping skills, I have healed from my past traumas, and I've learned how to love and respect myself. I want to say thank you for supporting this program. I know Gemma wouldn't be successful without the Board of Supervisors' help. I am proud to say that I am now a productive, healthy, successful member of society. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you for you. sharing. Good morning. My name is Becky Steinbrunner. I'm a resident of rural Aptos, and I'm running for county supervisor in the second district. I'm here this morning to um, sadly let you know that I am, I am forced to file yet another legal action against the county, and this is regarding County Service Area 48 Special Assessment. Your board certified that vote and approved the new tax on all um, CSA 48 voters at your last meeting, January 28th. Outside, I tried in the hall, I tried to find out what the appeal process is and was um, refused any information, only told, hire a lawyer, go to county council. I went to county council and only heard, hire a lawyer. <laughs> I couldn't even find out the statute of limitations. Supervisor friend, I sent you two emails asking you about this issue and trying to get some resolution and you didn't even reply. It was from finally Ms. Galloway here that I got the final answer. There will be no other action and I have to decide it in a, a court of law. So Supervisor Friend, you have frequently recently said every time the county tries to do something, we get sued. It is because of poor process like this that the residents, the citizens are forced to 
nothing but reactive legal action. I can't even find out the statute of limitations for doing anything. I can't get a conversation with anyone to try to get some resolution. And so I am going to assume that under other actions that the county takes, it's a 14 day statute of limitations. So today I will be filing something and I will be contacting the Secretary of State. I have reviewed the, most of the ballots and it is very upsetting to see that 101 ballots came in after the close of your public hearing but were not even opened. And some of them were from potentially very large property owners that the, the ballots were postmarked January 9th but they will not be included. And they're not even analyzed to see what would happen if they were included. That's against state election law in terms of ballots being postmarked but not counted. So once again, I will have to file some legal action today. I am open to discussion if any of you would please come. You all know this tax is unnecessary. This tax, the, the county gets $18 million with Proposition 172 money that the CAO likes to hang on to and dedicate zero to county fire. You all know that you can change that if you have the political will. And I'm asking you again, please dedicate just 10% of Proposition 172 money to fund county fire. Thank you. Monica McGuire, Coralitos, and uh, it's always great to follow Becky and to invite everyone watching this, everyone in the audience to please ask people to watch the beginning of this uh, particular board meeting because there are so many people speaking up about things that make no sense that we come to you over and over about. Um, I actually spoke with Mr. Friend on my birthday after the secret meeting, um, the, the fact that it was secret that all the state representatives were going to be there as well, that was never publicized and it's not on video, um, but one time that people could have come to hear more from all of you about what's happening next year, people didn't even know. And the only way they are ever gonna find out about what people say is to watch the beginnings of these meetings and to watch public comments because we're not included in the minutes because what we say isn't considered important enough to include apparently. And those are really problematic items. Um, Becky Steinbrenner running for supervisor is so exciting to those who get to hear from her and learn about her because it's so hard for her to get a voice when there's such a predominant way that people are not watching you and not keeping track of what's going on because they feel overwhelmed, because they don't feel listened to. And I took more time out of my schedule and took less sleep again because I received the mailer from the incumbent for uh, his election desiring, saying that we're welcome to come to him to ask him questions. And I just want the world to know that when I went to you about the Aptos Village Project, which you again voted on recently, and yet you have convinced people that all of this was just decided long before your time, somehow people think they can believe that despite that you all just voted for the second 40% or so, the second phase, to actually take place while having all the tremendous traffic problems that we already have through there. And when I came to you well before it was being, the first phase was being built and asked, what are you going to do to help the common sense question get answered? What are we supposed to do when you can't widen that Soquel Drive part more than the one lane in each direction and the parking problem because there will be fewer parking places than there were before. And you told me that I didn't need to ask that and you didn't need to listen to me because I'm not an engineer and that it didn't make any sense and that you don't need to know more because you trust the engineers who told you it won't be a problem no matter what. Then I asked you in public, what about a contingency plan at least please? What, what will be the contingency plan in case it turns into a problem? And you said, you know what? We just disagree. We just don't have see this the same way and therefore you should not be talking at a public meeting about this because you're taking up public time that you shouldn't. So it's not true that you're open to us coming and speaking to you. I have multiple friends who have had to move out of the area because they came to you and they were so horrified at your answers that this is a tourist town, what are you asking me questions like this for? That they left town. And most of us know that we're gonna be having to leave soon because of the costs in this county. Thank and we need a supervisor like Becky Steinbrenner who actually listens to us. Thank you. 
Thank you very much for your time. Marilyn Guerra, thanks to Becky Steinbrenner, who has my vote, and to Monica McGuire. Um, I'm a retired teacher, having attended Board of Supervisors meetings since I retired 20 years ago. I'm always, and I'm advocating for health and well being by refusing to you have more and more wireless microwave radiation harm from all these facilities. So I'm asking who benefits from your policies? I wanna quote um, Renette Senum, who is the mayor of Nevada City, California. She says 4G and 5G and the public right of way quote, is a corporate and a hostile takeover of our public right of way and with no concern for public health and the environment. This hostile takeover progresses and we are on continuous assault with microwave radiation warfare frequency. Now, where I live in the second district, Freedom Boulevard, Redwood Heights Road, um, Verizon 4G antennas were put up, and I know you're proud of this, Mr. Friend. Uh, your aide told me it was broadband where it really has come to Santa Cruz because of the leadership of Zach Friend. Um, I don't consider that a good leadership at all. 13 of these cell sites in a one mile area and my radiation detectors way up where it's got no reading before. You do not have the informed consent of all your constituents to be inflicting this harm and surveillance. Also, I think there's a conflict of interest with your being on the board of Yard Arm and receiving thousands of dollars because that's uh, more wireless technology that's needed. Another thing you brought was radar by the schools. Radar is a health hazard. You could put up signs about slow down, but that's a definite hazard. When um, Senate Bill 277 mandating vaccines uh, was before your board, before it was passed on the state level, and mothers were here whose children had been damaged by vaccines and had autistic children. And because you changed the wording of what was on the agenda, these mothers protested in the interests of their children. And you said to Supervisor Caput at the time, you don't know how to run a meeting because he was listening to these distraught mothers. And thank you, Gray Caput, for listening. And also the censorship of the consent agenda items. This isn't democratic, so very disturbing. You bet. And um, Marilyn, I, w I want to thank you for the persimmon cookies you gave me like a couple of weeks ago. Okay, thank you. Hi, Diana Nicole. Um, Oh, 60, 70 years ago, 80 years ago, they said nuclear power was safe. Nuclear radiation was safe when they first started exploding the atomic bombs. And of course, with research and scientific study, they discovered it was not safe. And this cell phone industry is very similar. This is a report called Mobile Telecommunications and Health, actually put out by the cell phone industry. The research was done, paid by the cell phone industry, uh, spearheaded or overseen in part by George Carlo. He wrote a book later about how the technology was dangerous for people. Um, this report is full of, report, of scientific studies that show it's not safe. And they stopped funding the studies here in the U.S. after this report came out. April of 2000. We haven't had a good cell phone study or electromagnetic uh, radio frequency study in the United States in a long time. Um, it just started to, to come out with some a few years ago, but there was a big gap. And um, I just, you know, it's up to this county to protect the public health and putting these 5G wireless transmitters right on the phone po poles or the electrical poles right outside people's homes is just not a good idea. 
it's, it will backfire in the long run. And it, I think that people need to really, you all have a duty to protect the public. Hello, um, my name is Sarah Leonard. I'm here representing Mental Health Client Action Network, MHCAN. And I'm here um, to thank you, Chairman Caput, and the MHAB, the Mental Health Advisory Board, um, for all of their work and for the recommendation of the consent agenda number 30 to change the one word that it currently states, support residents and lessen community impacts through increased access to integrated mental health, substance use disorder, and healthcare services. And the suggestion is that that one word, lessen, be changed to improve. And um, those of us who have mental health diagnoses, I myself am diagnosed with autism, paranoid schizophrenia with psychotic tendencies, bipolar disorder, etc. I own my own home, I have a mortgage, I work full time, and I'm, I believe, a positive person in this community. And so are my children, and so are everybody I know. So um, I really salute you, Chairman Caput, for taking such a consistent effort and such a consistent interest in helping members of our community be treated more positively and more appropriately, because it's really not a matter of even um, perspective, it's a matter of quality of services, and that under the American with Disabilities Act, those of us who are diagnosed with mental health diagnoses deserve equal services and equal treatment under the law. Um, MHCAN serves thousands of people with um, severe mental health diagnoses. We're located in Santa Cruz, and thank you for your help. And, um, and uh, on today's agenda, uh, we have the official change of the wording. Um, uh, and I'll let Mr. Palacios explain that. We, we're ch we're going to change the wording right now. Right, I know. That's why I said support. Right, the okay. Consent agenda. Thank you. Yeah, thank uh, you. Chair Caput, members of the board, I wanted to take this opportunity to introduce to you uh, Randy Morris, who is our new human services director. Uh, Randy, if you could come up and just introduce yourself to the board. He's, uh, this is his second week uh, working for the county. He comes to us from Alameda County. Um, thank you. It's my honor to meet all of you and my assistance in the process of scheduling meetings with you and scheduling meetings in the community so I can meet this community and I look forward to it. I thank Carlos for the confidence. Um, I do want to let your board know and the public know that uh, I took very seriously your board's role and watched a lot of videos of um, your work over in 2019. I was very impressed with your transparency and your willingness to comment on the work of public systems in the community. So I look forward to working with and for you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll have uh, uh, each member, if they have any comments on the consent agenda, and uh, then we'll go into making a motion. We'll, we'll start with the. Uh, uh, so. uh, thank you and good morning, everybody. Just a couple comments in one additional direction. Uh, on item number 24, which is public banking, I wanna thank the members of the public uh, who have been consistent advocates uh, for looking at new ways to finance, uh, and they're here today, uh, at, uh, new ways to, to provide finances financing for important public projects. Um, and my colleague, Supervisor Friend, for his work and advocacy on this. Um, I think uh, there's a long road ahead, but I do think the state has created a path where um, we can uh, be able to leverage public dollars more effectively uh, and at lower cost uh, for, for public projects that serve our community. On item number 24, which is the uh, recreation of the SART team or the SAFE team, um, I just wanna appreciate the work of the Sheriff's Office and getting this program back up and reestablished. It's incredibly important uh, that victims of sexual assault not have to travel travel over the hill. Um, and the report is also a sobering reminder of the number of, un of sexual assaults uh, in our community and what we need to do to, to reduce um, those in inconceivable traumas on, uh, on, on women in our community. On item number 47, I just want to, which is the water report, I just want to thank the citizens of Santa Cruz County for continuing to set a, uh, a mark of water conservation that is above and beyond any place around the state uh, and around the country. Uh, we do an incredibly remarkable job of uh, 
of using uh, or limiting our use of a scarce resource and uh, thank you to the staff who, uh, who keeps an eye on that, um, but to everyone in the community who's doing their part. Finally, on item number 48, which is a deferral uh, on the syringe litter contract, um, I understand and I've been in touch, pre uh, in touch with the health services agency. Um, I wanna make sure that we when um, and I understand that uh, they've been busy and trying to respond to a variety of concerns. Um, syringe litter, litter is still a, a major issue in our community that impacts public health, uh, access to, to our parks and open spaces um, and the overall vibrancy of our community. I wanna make sure that um, when this item comes back, uh, that, it in, that it is uh, responsive to the unanimous decision of the board, uh, that we not only have a contract with the streets team or other agency to clean up litter in the Emmeline neighborhood, but in uh, all the hotspots identified in the HSA syringe access and disposal report, Poganip to Coral Street, Depot Park to the Boardwalk and the Riverwalk, uh, in order to be responsive with the with the board's previous direction, which is responsive to the community. Um, so I'm going to resubmit um, the direction from the the December 10th meeting uh, to the clerk and make sure uh, that we have um, a syringe uh, cleanup program. And I think kiosks in partnership with the city are, an, are a really important strategy, but we need to have people there actually getting and picking up these needles uh, before they impact the public. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I first of all, wanna just uh, Repeat the welcome for Mr. Morris, Randy Morris as our Health and Human Services Director. You have some very big shoes to fill with from uh, with Ellen Timberlake. Uh, she was fantastic. And I really look forward to your professional leadership in this area that's so critical for our community. Uh, I do want to second um, Mr. Um, uh, uh, Coonerty's uh, support for the Central Coast Public Bank. I think it's, uh, it's really, exciting for us to investigate the feasibility of this. I think it can be a tremendous a asset for, as you said, to leverage uh, some public funds for us. On the um, on item number 28, uh, the uh, syringe commission, or secondary syringe commission, there's been a lot of interest in this commission. We've had more than uh, th those that we can appoint to that, uh, including in my district uh, as an at-large person, Les Gardner. Uh, I think that uh, this is a report that uh, people is, are waiting for from, or from this commission, but also we're waiting for to hear from the state of what they're going to do in allowing this or not allowing this. Uh, they probably will have to make their decisions certainly before the end of the month. I think they have 30 days to do it. But um, this is going to be a real uh, critical issue that we face in our community and address. Um, on, there's three items regarding mental health, uh, mental health uh, items number 30, 41, and 43. Uh, each of these uh, deals with the status or improving our behavioral health service delivery system, which I fully support, and I know every member of this board does. Uh, the California State Association of Counties, of which I'm the representative from this county, recently delivered several important <coughs> messages to the Assembly Subcommittee examining uh, funding and implementation of the Mental Health Services Act. Uh, we emphasize that counties uh, really are um, the, must retain those funds from MHSA and be allowed uh, three things, really flexibility. Um, we, we want some flexibility in this issue. We're gonna hear about it uh, and the funding and the transparency and accountability of the issues regarding the subject. Um, changing our, changes are gonna be coming in this area as the state legislature reconvenes uh, as it has for the first year. Um, and we really wanna make Make sure these uh, per, uh, these services will link good outcomes to our costs and have them fully reverse uh, reimbursed to our counties. Um, on items number 31 to 42, we have a dozen commissions with their annual reports that are coming to us. Um, and I just wanna say to those who serve on those commissions and the other 40, a total of 40 commissions or advisory boards, thank you for your service and your input to this, uh, to advising us of what, uh, what to do and what we, how we should address some issues that are really pressing in our communities. These commissions and advisory bodies uh, just don't get enough credit, uh, but we really do appreciate your work throughout the year, throughout the years, uh, because they really help us make uh, the decisions that we do come to here in uh, Santa Cruz County. Um, 
On item number 46, the Janus of Santa Cruz Staffing and Services. Um, I have a question regarding the Medi-Cal managed care network adequacy requirements that's cited, that's cited in the report. Um, the requirement for access to opioid treatment within three business days of request, outpatient treatment services within 10 business days of request, and the time and distance requirements, those are uh, requirements sound very close to treatment on demand and for Medi-Cal eligible patient, uh, patients. And I'm, I'm just wondering if, um, if I'm misinterpreting this report or is that what it amounts to? I don't know if anybody would like to answer that now or if maybe we could do that later. Uh, I would like to just get a better idea of that. Wait just a minute, I got one more. Just a minute. Go ahead. Good morning, board. I'm Eric Riera. I'm the director of behavioral health for Santa Cruz County. And uh, I can take a moment and respond to your question around the network adequacy requirements for our substance use disorder services. Um, these requirements come from both state and federal managed care regulations that were enacted a couple of years ago that all counties are required to abide by now for both substance use disorder services as well as mental health services in the community. We are required um, to submit a report to the state on a quarterly basis for all of our mental health services as well as an annual basis for our substance use disorder services to ensure that we are complying with these state and federal regulations. Failure to comply with the regulations can result in sanctions as well as a suspension of our state and federal funding. This actually happened on the mental health side last June, 10 counties lost their funding because they failed to comply with one or more of these new managed care requirements. So it is something that we pay particular attention to and work very hard to ensure that we're ad adhering to those regulations. Very good. Very uh, thank you for your response. Thank you. I, um, one item that's not on the consent agenda, but we're not going to be meeting again until February 25th, I believe it is. But uh, there's a great event that's going to happen on uh, the Felton Library is going to open on uh, have a ribbon cutting February 26 at 9.30 a.m. on Gushy Street. This is the first library since the library bond was uh, to be built since the library bond passed. Um, it's a tremendous facility. It looks just outstanding and uh, invite anyone and everyone to be there. Uh, good morning, Chair. Uh, just have a couple of items to comment on. Um, uh, we have many reports here from our uh, citizen commissions. Uh, these are our citizen volunteer leaders uh, that spend time working on critical issues and providing advice to this board of supervisors. They all do incredible work. I would just like to just point out two that I've had personal experience with this year um, uh, and have really appreciated. One is our women's commission uh, who has a great uh, set of work uh, that you can read about here. Uh, they also provided one of their co-chairs to serve on the task force for justice and gender who we heard about at our last meeting. Um, the work that they do to highlight the issues facing women and girls in our community is really important. Uh, they take the work seriously and I sincerely appreciate the work of all the members of the commission and their work to provide advice to this board. The other which I'd like to uh, speak about is the Mobile and Manufactured Home Commission, which I am the board's liaison to. Uh, this is an incredibly hardworking uh, group of people who really care about mobile home uh, park residents um, and serve as advocates uh, when there are issues within park and uh, can help resolve issues and provide a good guidance to to help people um, uh, have the resources to address any problems in parks. We have a bunch of great parks here in Santa Cruz County, but we have some that do not function well. So this kind of advocacy becomes incredibly important. I just wanna thank them for their work. On item number uh, 44, which is the approval of the sexual assault forensic examiner agreement, um, I'm glad to see this is moving forward. I am happy to see that we're expanding the program to include uh, coordination. Um, I'm glad also to see that we have a date in which this is gonna start. I think I've talked with the sheriff who is very committed to this program. Um, 
uh, recognizing that we are, that, that we do it slightly different here in Santa Cruz County. Uh, and that uh, putting together an excellent team to be able to meet the needs of women who've suffered uh, sexual assault is incredibly important and it's better to get it right than just to get it done. Uh, I'm hoping, however, that, that the April 1st date is something we can honor uh, and uh, start this program uh, after being uh, gone for the last two years here in Santa Cruz County. On item number 46, which is the, uh, the Janus report that my colleague just mentioned, I want to appreciate that Health Services is trying to work with the agency to identify ways in which they can receive funding for the work that they do. Um, and by doing that, help ensure that they have resources to be able to pay their staff uh, and reduce turnover. As the report uh, acknowledges, we have requirements that we have to meet with the, with the program to the state and making sure that they have uh, adequately trained staff and available staff to be able to meet those needs, not only affects the individuals who are in the program, but the county as a whole. And I hope that, the, uh, that this work uh, and support that we're offering will help Janice be a stronger organization. On item number 47, the annual uh, water resource management uh, report, uh, this is a this is like a, a primer on all the things going on around water in our community, which is an incredibly important resource, much talked about. Um, will decide the future of our county, and I appreciate the hard work that goes into this report uh, from our water resources staff. I see a couple of them here: John Ricker, Sierra Ryan. Uh, and uh, I will, can say that there is work going on and we hope in April to have a, another Connecting the Drops event that connects the county, LAFCO, and water agencies uh, to be able uh, to talk about what's happening in water. Thank you for your ongoing work. It's really critical and there's great success this year just in the Mid-County Groundwater Sustainability Plan uh, of which you played a big role in. Uh, lastly, on item number 48, um, I was hoping that we would have this report from the health services agency and I was hoping that our health, uh, our human services department would be here with a contract with the downtown streets team uh, because uh, I know that I participated in a cleanup in the Grant Park neighborhood. We talk with uh, neighbors, we've heard from them here at our board and we made commitments to them about, uh, about having a program uh, up in February. Um, it seems like we're gonna be close to that. I was, I was hoping that this was gonna be in this report. Um, I wanna encourage our staff to work harder to make sure we can get that happening so we can honor those requests from the public uh, and uh, be able to help clean up the, any impact uh, that is created by trash being uh, associated with our facilities. Um, and with that, that's it. Mr. Chair, I, I guess I, I've been advised, maybe I should uh, clarify the opening of the, the Felton Library is Saturday, February 22nd at 9.30. I don't know if somebody, said, maybe I said the wrong date. Saturday, February 22nd at 9.30. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just two brief items. On item 24, I'd like to also extend my appreciation to the community group that brought forward the, the item regarding the public bank, both initially for this board's advocacy through Supervisor Coonerty, and then at the state, and now that we've received the state uh, approval to try and determine whether we can do something here in the Central Coast, I think that it would allow us uh, more appropriately to invest our money and our values in many respects uh, throughout this area. So I appreciate that this is a first step, but I think that it's a significant first step in moving forward to see whether it's feasible. And just a brief appreciation on item uh, 51 for public works. This regards Sumner and the emergency repairs. I'd like to uh, appreciate Director Machado who has gone out to that neighborhood with me to explain some of the issues regarding this repair. And he's been very good at communicating with the community about that. I just appreciate the work of public works. It's a pretty major repair as a lot of our culverts and infrastructure as they get older uh, will be. But this is a significant project for my district. And I just appreciate the work of public works. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'll move the agenda as amended. Okay, we have a first and we have a second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposition passes unanimously. Thank you. And now, <clears throat> now we'll move to, uh, uh, we have a 
regular agenda item and it's the presentation of Clay Kemp, executive director of the Seniors Council on Age Friendly Communities as outlined in the memorandum of Supervisor McPherson. And then after that, we will have the mental health uh, advisory board uh, presentation that will address the, uh, uh, what I mentioned earlier about the uh, grand jury report of three years ago. How you doing? Good, how are all of you? Good, Good morning, morning. And, and thanks for having me here, I appreciate it. Uh, as Greg mentioned, I'm Clay Kemp, I'm the executive director of the Seniors Council. And the Seniors Council just celebrated its 40th birthday. We actually consist of uh, five different programs, so I thought I'd just throw that off to, to kick off. And, and what we did in that uh, celebration at, at our advisory council meeting, which both uh, Supervisor um, or Chairman Caput and Supervisor McPherson are, are parts of, we looked at the last 40 years and some of our celebrations and challenges and also look forward to maybe the next 10 or 20. So I think what this presentation is gonna be about is kind of giving an overview of where we are now and then highlighting our age-friendly community project. Uh, Mr. Kemp, could you just hold on one minute? I think we're trying to figure out how we can see it on the screen sure. at the same time. I'm not sure whether the, the, it looks like the TV can see it. The TV's bouncing on and off, but it seems to be there. So. To make a, a really ageist statement, I had no problems with technology and using it until I turned 60. And, and it's literally when I turned 60, my computer started crashing, my cell phone wasn't working right, et cetera. Okay. We're, we're back here. Okay, ready to go? So this is who we are. And uh, the update on some of the stuff that's going on, I don't want to you know, read what every program does and, and so forth. Our time's all precious, and I think most of you know that. And if somebody in the audience wants more information about any of these, uh, you know, they can look us up or talk to me afterwards. So our mission, one of the reasons I like this mission is it's really about independence and dignity for older adults. And I think that's very consistent with what the Board of Supervisors goal is, except not just for older adults for all ages. And it's one thing that I, I truly appreciate about this board is that we may disagree, we may disagree passionately on different issues, but I think our ultimate goal um, is always the same. And that makes all of you very um, great to work with, honestly. So the Area Agency on Aging is a key member of the community in that we receive two million in state and federal funds and we look to see the most effective agencies um, in our area providing those services and then that's how we distribute the funds after we do a needs assessment which is going right on right now and after that we do a plan for how we're gonna deliver services to meet existing needs and emerging ones. And that's something we'll be sharing with you in a couple months is the results of that needs assessment. Um, one thing that we rarely do internally or externally is talk about our successes because there are always so many new challenges, so many new things to do. So I thought that I should take a moment to just reflect on some of the success we had last year. And that was one of, I think, the great things we did when we did the 40-year review is look at how far we've come and the things that have worked well. Um, and just as an FYI, uh, there's about a dozen, 12 or 13 slides here that, that uh, we'll be going through. So in 2019, I think our greatest success 
is that we led an effort to increase state funding for senior nutrition programs by 17 and a half million. We tried to work on that for multiple years and last year we had great success. So in our county, that's gonna bring in about 200,000 more for senior nutrition this year. Um, just got the contract making that real. So we're both excited and proud about that effort. And then we partnered with a number of other organizations and usually in a pretty, pretty leading role in that. Uh, you can see some of the things on here. Um, we're trying to get right now roll out a falls prevention program. It's a pilot program at this point for um, 18 months and we're having legislation this coming year to try to make that funding permanent. So in your packet, you'll see what our legislative priorities are for 2020 and we hope the board and staff can endorse that and help us achieve some of those goals. A um, couple other things that we uh, were active in leading was creating funding for a no wrong door aging and disability connection project. We're trying to roll that out in San Benito County right now with the idea that smaller community is probably easier to coordinate services in than a larger community. And once we finish San Benito County, we would take that model to Santa Cruz County and you know, hopefully um, benefit from lessons learned, including good things that we did and bad things that we did. Um, just as we're doing the opposite with age-friendly communities. We're actually doing that first in Santa Cruz County because I think there's more city leadership than probably in San Benito County, plus a couple more cities. So once we finish that here, then we'll jump over to San Benito County. So each county is getting a shot at uh, a couple of our special projects. And those special projects, I mentioned the legislative platform um, we're also um, doing some of these other things that I mentioned, and the last two bullets, um, I think, are the ones that we want to focus on. Um, the governor's master plan for aging is a Governor Newsom's executive order for the state to come up with a plan for how California is going to deal with the rapid growth of older adults. And I'm lucky enough to be the um, only AAA representative on that steering committee. The master plan is due in October, Drafts of it will be out next month and our steering committee will be reviewing that and listing the pros and cons and priorities. Um, a little tidbit if people are really interested in this, there's a um, master plan for aging webinar that happens every Wednesday from 9.30 to 11. It's really um, very educational and helpful. Um, it's always topic driven. I did one a week ago on, on senior transportation. And then lastly, and what um, we're gonna focus on today is leading the Santa Cruz County Age-Friendly Community um, Partnership. So age-friendly communities are also known as livable communities. Um, it's been found out that once you make a community age-friendly, it actually helps all ages. Um, millennials went through a study about what would make a community more livable for them, and the items and domains were almost exactly the same as what was in age-friendly. It was initially a program of the World Health Organization and a North America AARP has taken the lead on it. And if you look at Age Friendly on the AARP website, you'll find an incredible list of tools for how your community can become age friendly. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel on it. And the most fascinating thing to me on that is there's a tool to measure how any community is doing in the eight domains of age friendliness that they identify. You can get a score for your city, for your county, for your neighborhood. And that's updated um, a couple times a year so we know it's current information. So a great, um, great place to get resources to look at uh, immediate status and cumulative impact. The status we have right now is that um, Santa Cruz County was the first of our communities to join this effort. The county hasn't yet submitted a formal notice of application to AARP, so we're standing by to help you submit that. Um, this afternoon, so the city of Watsonville hopefully will become the second city to take action and then we have champions in Santa Cruz, in Capitola, in Scotts Valley that want to move this forward. Uh, the, the general process is AARP 
um, recommends a four to five year process. Usually the way that works is in the first two or three years, the plan is developed, and then the following years are really just monitoring or tracking success and achieving that plan. So it's really designed to be a living ongoing document, which is one of my favorite things. I don't like strategic plans that, you know, we spend a ton of time and effort to do and then nobody ever looks at it once it's completed. The model that we're putting forward and working on is that we will convene leaders from all the cities to work on one plan together. And that way we save a tremendous amount of our staff time and your staff time, and we don't have to do this five times. It's one effort. Um, each city will retain their own ability to reject or accept things in the plan, but our goal is to have um, a work group of critical staff or critical community members on each of the domains. And I'll talk about the domains in a second. We're also looking at having the AAA Advisory Council providing the official oversight to that work group. And the reason for that is none of us need more meetings to attend. And this is one place where there's a representative of each city and two representatives of the Board of Supervisors that meet on a regular basis. So we're, uh, again, trying to save time and be efficient and, and pull everybody together. So the age-friendly community model has these eight domains of livability. And you can see them all on here. I think everybody can read it. Um, the work group and strategy we're taking is the work group will address these one at a time and they'll determine which ones we want to address when or if two of these can be combined or if there's one we just want to drop out or if there's others we want to add. And there's tools, like I mentioned before, each one of these work groups has specific tools that you can use to create your own age-friendly plan. The last bullet on this is that hopefully the work group will consider um, whether or not it will favor creating a ninth domain of emergency pre preparedness and disaster response. This has been the most popular addition around the state, so we think that would be um, appropriate here. And I would actually argue we should do that first. You know, we don't want to do that last because that's kind of showing lack of preparation for the actual item. So the steps we need to take to get there is going through all this work as a community. And again, I think the work group will establish a way where each county, you know, or the county and each city share best practices, and they also steal from each other from time to time. You know, somebody from Santa Cruz City could say, Watsonville, that's a great idea. We want to take that and vice versa. However, the universal plan will kind of be, here's 10 steps all of us want to take but maybe the county is only gonna work on eight of those steps. Maybe one of the cities is only going to work on six of them. Maybe another city is going to do seven, however it plays out. So the plan would be comprehensive in showing everything that's happening in our community, but each city would highlight that we're doing these six things, or we're doing all 10, or however that plays out. And I think one of the great things about this approach is it talks about the good things you're doing. And I think it's far too rare that elected officials ever get to talk about their successes. <clears throat> Just like we listed our success here, we kind of normally do things and then move on to the next challenge. And, and I think all the work and great work that's done is too often forgotten. So this is one very real way to highlight those positives. We actually also don't want to roll out the plan in three years. We want to roll out the plan for each domain as it's completed. And that also creates momentum, and that lets us show the success that we have every three months or every six months or however frequently those come up. So again, it's just another way to make it a more dynamic plan where everybody reviews it and, and lives with it. So the steps we need to take, we need councils or the board to take action. That's already been done here. Commit to the share of cost, which is the next slide. Um, and then we need to submit a membership application to AARP. It's about a two-page app. It's very simple. I've got some drafts at which I would share with staff to uh, move forward. Um, we need to figure out who's going to be the leadership or participant in the work group. 
typically that staff, but it could be electeds, it could be a combination. And some of those domains, if you look back on them, they're gonna have different people that wanna work on each work group. Like for example, transportation is one of the work groups. That's something where we obviously want Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz Metro to be there. We'd want Transportation Commission staff, et cetera. Maybe public works for streets and roads. But we don't need those people to work on the provision of medical services or healthcare services. So we'd like to have one consistent person from each jurisdiction that works on all the plans or all the domains, but a different person as the domains pop up based on the need and appropriateness for who should be in the room. Um, the work group meetings, we're hoping that would meet about um, one time a month. Uh, we could do more if we need to. Here's the share of cost page. Uh, I broke this down based on a penny per week per senior in the jurisdiction. And uh, these are estimates based on we, what we know the 60 plus population to be. So you can see the right hand column is really the contribution from each jurisdiction. The county has the most people, um, therefore the biggest contribution, you can see the number, it's about 16,500. So we're asking for that to be part of it. In terms of a plan like this, I think that's a bargain. Um, we're committed to providing half the staff cost to it. So you get um, not only you know, that benefit, but also the benefit of other cities chiming in. And then lastly, I just wanna share this chart. This is like my new favorite chart about what's going on with older adults in our state. And this is uh, taking numbers from Department of Finance, uh, of California Department of Finance, and looking from 2011 to 2018, what the growth in the state is of different age groups. And I just think this is remarkable in that 59, people who are 59 and under statewide have grown by less than one and a half percent. And the 60 plus population has grown by 29%. So we hear a lot about the tsunami of aging or the coming of the baby boomers. It's not coming anymore, it's here, it's happening. And this is why being proactive by doing something like creating age friendly communities, I think is critical. And I like to say in terms of costs, how there's not resources available to pay for plans like this. I think there aren't resources available not to pay for plans like this. Because if we do nothing except what we do now, the costs that the older adults are going to put out on our community, and I'm one of them, are going to skyrocket just based on the sheer numbers of their growth. So if we're proactive, let's look at what that growth in expenses is going to be and figure out a better way to spend it. And I think that's what this is all about. So that's it. Um, if anybody has any questions, happy to field them. Yeah, and I guess I'm the legitimate one to sure. make an address on this board about this subject. But uh, I, I just want to thank Clay Kemp for everything he does and his tireless, dedicated effort to do this. He's been at this for many, many years and uh, is recognized statewide uh, as being a real voice in how we can make better living conditions for the aged community. That, that statistics about the, the person uh, aging in the last eight years, the percentages, how they've grown, um, really, really touches on how we need to act uh, and we should act at this point. Um, I, I'd like to say also with as a member, as uh, I think I mentioned earlier of uh, the CSAC board, the California State Association of Counties, they, uh, what's encouraging is the state is also really engaged in this. As Clay Kemp just mentioned, uh, Governor Newsom wants a master plan for aging by October of this year, um, a single point of entry. The funding's not there, which is not unusual. That's gonna have to come sometime, I think, to make this a success. But um, the, I know the uh, California State Association of Counties meets this week and one of the uh, uh, few items that it has is just to discuss this uh, plan, California's master plan on aging. So the state is engaged in this. I think it's proper and uh, that we are, and I know that every other county, I feel confident that every other county is becoming engaged in this as well. So um, I just wanna say thank you for getting us at the front of the line as we often are in Santa Cruz County in the past on some of these issues, but I think we should be there uh, in the right now or in the near future and as well, far as the budgeting aspect of it, that might take another time or, or place that we'd have to go, but $16,000, um, 16 dollars something like that, 
is not too much to ask for really improving the lifestyle and the opportunities for the aged community in Santa Cruz County. So I wanna thank you for your efforts and everything you have done. And uh, it's been a pleasure to work with you on the area agency, uh, area agency on the aging. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Um, uh, uh, Chair, I also like to acknowledge uh, Mr. Kempf uh, for his work. You know, is, he's a great example of uh, what we do here in Santa Cruz. We're not the largest county. Um, we don't have the biggest population, but um, we develop really great leaders. Um, and Clay Kempf has been a leader uh, on the issues of uh, aging and seniors and need for services. And your first slide, which you went through quickly, showing all those additional resources for seniors uh, that you played a leadership role in, a, in making sure the legislature provided those uh, funds. Um, it, we, we should spend more time on that because uh, that's a real win. Um, I, I also think um, that your request to us, uh, a penny for a senior, uh, also seems to be a fair way, uh, actually quite generous way of, uh, uh, I mean, in terms of the seniors, uh, the, the, for us to provide resources to make this happen. Uh, I, I agree that the age-friendly plan is, is gonna benefit more than just seniors. Uh, I think it's gonna benefit us as, as a community. Uh, and I think that it, it will help us think differently about the way in which we provide these services to make sure that they, are, they best meet the needs of the people who live here. When I looked at that last chart about uh, the changing nature of demographics in California, that, that looks pretty much what, what it looks like here in Santa Cruz. It'd be interesting to take a look at what the, what the numbers would be or projected to be in uh, Santa Cruz. But uh, I think that uh, I already see it in Live Oak, we have a greater number of seniors proportionally than most other parts of the county because of the large number of mobile home parks. And we also have a very young community and the demographic change that we, that we uh, are expecting here in Santa Cruz, we're already experiencing in Live Oak. And so this plan will be helpful uh, to combine with all of our other efforts to make sure that we have a thriving community for uh, whoever lives here, no matter what their age. I really appreciate the work that, that you do when I uh, look forward to the county continuing to work on this age-friendly plan um, and all the efforts to support seniors in our community. And, and to answer the, the Santa Cruz County question, we have looked at that. In Santa Cruz County, the 59 and under population has decreased by three or 4% in that time frame, And the 60 plus has increased by 48%. Wow. So it's even more critical locally than statewide. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Uh, yes. Okay. Thank you all again. Really appreciate your ongoing support and working on this project together in the future. Thank you. And uh, now, <clears throat> now uh, do we have any comments from the public? Okay. And we'll go on to uh, present, uh, presentation of the Mental Health Advisory Board as outlined in the memorandum. And uh, you can come up here. I know there's one, two, three, four. You can take the four seats up here. Come on in through. That way you don't have to stand there. <coughs> and uh, I, <coughs> I think it's, uh, I think it's really nice. Uh, we have somebody here from the uh, civil grand jury uh, because a few years ago. Uh, the grand jury had a list of things that they wanted to have addressed and fixed with the uh, Mental Health Advisory Board. And uh, that was like a template for what, we're, what we tried to do and took a, it eliminated a lot of confusion that was going on at the time. So this is a product of, like was mentioned by Supervisor McPherson, when you have commissions or you have the grand jury and they make recommendations, we take them seriously. And hopefully, uh, Serge, we've taken care of the wording. Uh, is it, I, I, I had it highlighted, is it, it, we took care of the wording, right? Okay, so uh, call off the hounds. <laughs> okay, <laughs> go ahead. 
Good to Go see ahead. You. So, hi, I'm uh, Shalak Kabanis. I'm the chair of the uh, Santa Cruz Mental Health Advisory Board, and I love Santa Cruz. And I'm joined here today. Hi, I'm Erica Miranda Bartlett. I am the co chair of the Mental Health Advisory Board. Serge Cagno. Um, and we are here to submit our biannual report. We would like to thank the Board of Supervisors for their support and their appointing of highly qualified board members. It's with that that I'm really sad to say that after seven years of dedication, uh, Kate Abrams from District 5, Bruce McPherson, is going to be stepping down. Kate, thank you so much for your seven years of dedication and hard been work. a great honor. Thank you. Um, we wanted to... Oh. At the end, okay. Um, we want to acknowledge the, uh, con her contributions and say farewell at our next board meeting, which will be February 20th at 1400 Emmeline, 3 p.m. Plug. Um, I would like to thank the amazing uh, support provided by Eric Rera, the uh, Director of Behavioral Health. Um, he does an amazing job of explaining things, of being there. He is a tired, tireless champion um, for our community and really um, is super dedicated. Uh, really appreciate his help as well as uh, our administrative assistant, Jane Boons. Uh, Kurtz, Kurtz, I'm a little nervous. I'm going to be blotching names. I'm going to apologize ahead of time. Um, and finally, I'd like to say a big thank you to you, uh, Supervisor Greg Kaput. Um, there's about three of us who are tied for best attendance, and you're one of them, uh, me and Serge. Uh, so thank you so much for your support um, and your active participation. Really uh, appreciate it. Um, uh, please read our report. Uh, it includes our plan uh, merger with the Substance Use Disorder Commission. It uh, has a strategic plan for the suicide prevention. Uh, includes the Mental Health Service Act Steering Committee. Achievements made by NAMI, MH CAN, Second Story, trainings, uh, our presentations, and our site tours. Uh, however, we'd like to uh, highlight some important uh, particular issues of importance. Uh, starting off with the Live Oak Cradle to Career Initiative led by Supervisor John Leopold. Uh, this initiative provides full supportive wraparound services for youth in Live Oak. It has changed the paradigm of providers telling parents what their children's needs are. It has made an accessible platform for parents' voices to be heard and the providers to listen. By entrusting the parents' knowledge on what support and services they need for their students and listening to those parents who are directly affected by the services. So amazing, amazing um, initiative. Uh, I also want to talk about the Wellness Center. It is a grant initiative that is in the sunset uh, between Sequoia Schools and Encompass Community Services. In the last two years, 863 students have utilized the Wellness Center as needed on a drop-in basis. The school staff reports that it has improved students' resiliency. The goal is to ensure trauma-informed mental health and wellness services are available and accessible to all students, to support school staff, and to and cultivate a trauma-informed school culture. This includes individual sessions, social emotional circles, mindfulness groups, and the development of a harm reduction substance use group. This room uh, run by Encompass's social emotional counselor, Pablo Orco Castro, uh, this room has couches, aromatherapy, books, low lights, snacks, uh, kinetic sculptures. This is a place where a student who's having a hard time with whatever, whether it's impulse control, frustration, uh, anger, hunger, uh, the students can go. They can de-escalate. They can receive support, and they're both they are back quickly, both physically and mentally, in the classroom, prepared to learn. Our students will uh, our students will not succeed in society if they're not prepared for all areas of life. The Wellness Center supports our students to be successful. It would be a tragedy to lose this progressive student health center approach that has provide, uh, proven to provide much needed support to our students. Hi, I'd like to first start by talking about peer support in our community. I think that it's essential that we continue to support these services. Um, Second Story is the first peer respite that was opened in California, and it's currently uh, operated by Encompass Community Services. Um, Mental Health Advisory Board Hugh McCormick covered the uh, abrupt closure of the facility, which was going to happen in 2018. However, this publicity from a Mental Health Advisory Board member through the good times did lead directly to a large charitable donation, which has allowed the trailblazing program to continue providing services to our community. 
As second story peer respite continues to be the county's only alternative to restrictive inpatient hospitalization, uh, it is essential that we continue to support it. And currently the peer run program will now lose its funding when the public's generous donation runs out. I also want to speak about MH Can. The Mental Health Client Action Network continues to be a unique, accessible resource for many devoted members with their inspiring stories um, despite the restrictive use permit by the city of Santa Cruz. The Mental Health Advisory Board has written a letter of support for MHCAN, which should have been sent in January 2020. And due to ongoing concern, uh, the Advisory Board will review the special use permit. Um, the remarkable work done by the peers of MHCAN and the exceptional transformative atmosphere found in the respite of Second Story are made possible because these services are provided by people like me who have lived experience of mental health issues and emotional instability. As peers recover, we help our community recover and the system recovers. In practice, all re involved receive multiple benefits, including a potential exit from the medical model and that patient identity which means that we will eventually be able to reintegrate into our great community. Additionally, speaking about reintegration, I wanted to mention that the Santa Cruz County Jail is in fact one of the county's biggest mental health providers. What we learned from the community during the time of our jail committee is that we need trauma-informed training for every jail employee, full accountability for inmates' treatment, and enhanced transparency about any and all jail conditions. Of course, the high rate of staff turnover in the Santa Cruz County jail system makes this difficult. However, the multiple lawsuits related to some serious injuries at the Santa Cruz County main jail and our area's other correction facilities speak for themselves and the need for increased education and assistance. Uh, the Mental Health Advisory Board was able to address one serious concern about a common difficulty of finding clear information about many of the jail's procedures, programs, and resources. Board member Hugh McCormick, once again, did create and compile the extensive jail orientation guide for friends and family members of inmates in the Santa Cruz County jail system. This 45 plus page orientation guide is now freely available in the lobby of the Santa Cruz County Main Jail as a PDF version on the jail's website and used by Santa Cruz County's probation department and public defenders among others. Um, under the leadership of Superintendent Dr. Ferris Sabat, the Santa Cruz County Office of Education had two very successful strategic plan kickoff events. Both were uh, well attended by students, family, and community partners. The South County event, which was on January 21st, uh, uh, MC'd by Community Action Board's Executive Director, uh, Marina Elena de la Gar Garza. Uh, Supervisor Zach Friend, you were there. Um, I saw the Chief of Police, uh, Watsonville Chief of Police, David Honda, as well as the Mayor of Watsonville, Francisco Estrada. Uh, the North County event, which was held on January 28th, was hosted by the uh, California State Assembly member, John Laird. Uh, Bruce McPherson, you were there. I saw Ryan, uh, Ryan Coonerty there, uh, Supervisor Ryan Coonerty, uh, the mayor of the city of Santa Cruz, Martine Watkins, as well as vice mayor of Capitola, uh, Yvette Brooks was also in attendance. Uh, these both uh, were amazing events that rolled out the Santa Cruz County's Office of Education Strategic Plan, a multi-tiered approach to support the whole students. The CUE has partnered both with Encompass Community Services and the Santa Cruz County Mental Health for behavioral health uh, aspects of student support. Historically, schools focus primarily on scholastic success. However, this new comprehensive strategic plan takes, in, takes into account that unless the students are supported to be successful in all areas of their life, grades don't matter. Dr. Fair Sapat has a vision of lifelong learners teaching people to be passionate and self-motivated about learning throughout one's life. As we draw our presentation to a close, I wanted to speak about the future goals of the Mental Health Advisory Board, which I think have become even more ambitious and um, yeah. So we wish to increase our knowledge of all the programs in the Santa Cruz community, eventually resulting in a publication with a clear roadmap for family and peers to access these resources, many of which are funded through Medi-Cal. 
we wish to increase uh, our engagement with the community via events and having presence at things like the uh, grand opening of the new Watsonville Health Center. Um, and also reaching out to our community, our peers, and the houseless population to make sure that they are at our meetings where their voices can be heard and um, passed along to you, supervisors. We are also intending to increase the number of our site visits, although Santa Cruz County may not have as many facilities as larger counties, we definitely wanna make sure that um, the clients and peers that are at these programs are being heard by an outside voices. Um, and yeah, finally to, to mention what you just talked about was the grand opening of the South County Mental Health Facility. That was amazing. Um, it helps uh, demolish the obstacles to accessing care by having so many support systems easily accessible and available at one site, breaking down the silos of trying to access that care. Um, to take a word from Jay, Gray, Gray uh, uh, <laughs> Supervisor Kaput, as he spoke um, during the opening. Uh, this too was well attended by community members, county personnel, Watsonville Police Chief David Honda, and many elected officials. I, I, waited, I witnessed both uh, uh, Supervisor Gray Kaput and the uh, uh, Santa Cruz County CAO, uh, Carlos Palacio, cut the ribbon, like with a huge smile. It was awesome, it was, it was emotional, <laughs> it was empowering. Um, I, I thank you for your time. Thank you for your support and thank you for this opportunity. I think this opportunity led to uh, me getting the United Way um, uh, Community Action Projects uh, Hero Award. And that meant the world to me and to be of service to my community and to have you guys um, as our leaders, uh, really appreciate it, thank you. Please read the report. We did just briefly skim over it and I put a lot of time into it. So we really appreciate uh, your attention and this is such an essential um, aspect of our community because so often mental health concerns can separate community members from their family and loved ones. And with a, a treatment, we recover. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, if you have any questions or we do. Uh, Serge, you asked me at one of the meetings, uh, the last meeting, and I, I don't know if we got the answer to you or not. I, I'm drawing a blank now. You think about it later, but I think we addressed everything. Okay. And do uh, we have any questions or comments from the board? Yeah, I just wanna thank you for your hard work. This is all um, people in the community caring for both other people in the community and our community as a whole. Uh, and this was quite a staggering list of things going on and accomplishments and uh, uh, guidebooks to come. And so um, I just wanna really take a moment to appreciate. We often, I think as you mentioned, we often hear only negative stories and, uh, and uh, concerns and impacts and the fact that um, uh, you're changing that narrative and changing lives is, uh, is really remarkable. And I just wanna thank you all for your work. Yeah, I, I do too. That this um, and and congratulations too, well deserved, and for everybody else. And and Kate, we're going to miss you. You know, they're they're going to miss you very much. Thank you for your service to the commission. Uh, I just I think it's very encouraging to see the different agencies, uh, particularly like the, the county office of education, which you mentioned, to get an identity and an explanation of what we're facing here and what what ingredients are involved in this whole subject matter. I think uh, our superintendent is is just been uh, very outgoing and uh, very, very uh, receptive of um, taking ideas and, and presenting some too. And, uh, and again, as I mentioned in an earlier subject on aging, um, the, uh, the California State Association of Counties, it's one of their issues that they're gonna be talking about when we meet uh, on Thursday about the, um, the working group and how, how uh, the funding protections are needed, uh, the flexibility and transparency and accountability. I can assure you that each and every one of the 58 counties in the state of California has this uh, as one of the top items on their list to discuss in this legislative year and, and uh, later as well. But uh, thank you for everything you do. It's, uh, it's what you really call dedicated work and we appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you. I wanna appreciate the Mental Health Advisory Board for the work that you do. It's when reading the report, it's very clear that uh, success for individuals in our community who might be uh, 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 facing uh, behavioral health uh, challenges 
uh, require us to work as a community to weave together the different the strands, whether it be schools, uh, county agencies, nonprofits, families. Um, and what this report shows is the hard work that you are doing looking at the, at the different aspects of each part of the continuum of care to figure out how we can best provide these services and meet the needs of uh, families that might be in cri crisis. Um, I think that uh, that uh, I'm, I'm humbled by your recognition of the Live Oak uh, Cradle to Career uh, program uh, because it's the idea of parents playing a role in deciding what's best for their children is, uh, we see this and play itself out in lots of different ways and the ways in which we were uh, tied in the, the, the health center with the school district and the families to be able to meet the, the needs greater than um, maybe one of the institutions can do by themselves uh, really has played a big role in the success of that program. Um, I also appreciate the advocacy uh, that members of the commission have shown uh, for uh, critical programs, the second story program, obviously, uh, you could say wouldn't it have been saved without the, uh, without the work that, uh, uh, that Mr. McCormick had done um, to get that recognized, to, uh, to raise its prominence in the community, to find uh, whoever that mysterious donor is to, to contribute the money. Um, and uh, that wouldn't have happened unless you have advocates. Um, I also had the good pleasure of serving with Rebecca Mills uh, on the Task Force for Justice and Gender, who um, uh, had spoke to us very clearly about the challenges that women face in our county jail system and changes that we need to, to make in order to make the system work better. So that advocacy is critical. Uh, it's, it's important. I appreciate the work of my colleague, uh, uh, our chair, uh, to be a regular participant in that and represent the board on that work. And I look forward to continuing to be part of uh, the work of the Mental Health Advisory Board and reading about the successes that you've had. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Chair. And I wanna add uh, my thanks and praise and also a note of, of the tenure of so many of these members, which is not common on all the commissions that we have, which shows the dedication of all of you to seeing things through all the way. I mean, the report was great. I appreciate the work of my colleague as well uh, for his dedication. And also the fact that I see you out at so many other community events representing the commission. It's a very important but unheard and untold story in my opinion, which is that you put in enough time on the commission, but then you're out spreading uh, the importance of what the commission's doing to uh, community, other community-based organizations and putting in a lot of additional volunteer time. And so I uh, appreciate running into you at those events because it shows that that's why we have these advisory bodies is to not just advise the board, but to raise these issues of awareness throughout the community. And you're doing a great job of that. So thank you. Yeah, I'll just give special recognition to Ms. Avram, uh, who uh, we all get to share a little piece of because she was the fifth district appointee. She lived for a good time in the first district and she now lives in the second district. So she is really a county representative. Uh, uh, Watch out, Zach. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, your, your um, ongoing dedication to this issue and supporting people in the community is fantastic. It's a loss to the advisory board, but I'm sure we will see you in some other capacity. So thank you for your work. Um, I remembered the things that I wanted to mention. Uh, thank you for the support on the strategic plan wording. Um, look forward to having conversations and supporting staff actually figuring out how they're gonna implement that change and actually advertise that change. Um, and the second thing I wanted to support uh, Behavioral Health doing the Mental Health Services Act. They're doing some stakeholder outreach um, uh, this week to try to inform the public more of what, how that money is being spent. I'm on the city of Santa Cruz's uh, community advisory committee on homelessness. And there's a lot of city concerns about that funding. So I really appreciate that outreach and that sharing of information um, and really appreciate the opportunity here to try to get the city and the county to working together on mental health issues and homelessness issues. Thing. The North I, sorry, the North County meeting is today uh, at Simpkins Swim Center, and I believe it starts at 5.30. The South County meeting is next Tuesday at 5.30 at the um, 
community room near Watsonville Community Hospital and they assured, assured me that they'd have a sign out front because it's a little difficult to find. <laughs> Everybody great. knows where Simpkins swims. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to thank all of you, of course, and uh, <clears throat> it's been a pleasure to be working with you. I actually enjoy going to the meetings, and uh, uh, it's uh, to see what uh, the progress that you've made and, and helping out the community uh, <clears throat> is uh, very, very important. Uh, I don't know, now Kate, you're, you'll be stepping down, but uh, who will report, uh, replace uh, the a nomination? Uh, what it's, district it's, is that now? If it's, it's, it's Bruce. Bruce. It's Supervisor okay, McPherson. You're got, you got really going to have to look. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's going to be tough. <laughs> We're going to have words from the public, but I, I want to do this uh, first real quick. Uh, it's a proclamation for you, Kate. And uh, whereas Kate was born and raised in Santa Cruz, California to Ellis and Eleanor Aver, where she uh, went to Del Mar Elementary School, SoCal High School, Cabrillo College, and transferred to the University of California, Riverside, where you studied English, art, and French. Uh, do you speak any French? Pretty good? <laughs> <laughs> okay, and in 1972, Kate continued her studies abroad in Paris, France, graduated in 1973, Phi uh, Beta Kappa. I mean, that's as high as you get. Uh, that's wonderful. That's Latin. Uh, from the University <laughs> of California, Riverside, with a Bachelor of Arts in English and Art History, and you later received a master's degree in both art uh, therapy and psychology from Mary Hurst University in Portland, Oregon. Your career has been rich and varied, uh, work with the University of California, Santa Cruz, McHenry Library, many years spent as children librarian in the Monterey Public School System. And you've been with the Santa Cruz County Mental Health Advisor, Advisory Board for seven years. And uh, I can go on here, uh, friendly visitors to the elderly, uh, native animal rescue, uh, Temple Beth El Mazan project, and uh, providing meals to the River Street Homeless Shelter. Um, whereas Kate, uh, your true passion, I, I believe, is uh, your published, uh, you're a writer, and your published books include Joey's Way, What Will You Be, Sarah Me, and Where Are We All, We Are All Related, uh, as well as poetry that has been published in journals and chapter books. Uh, wh which one are you most proud of, of, of your books? Which one has sold the most copies? <laughs> <laughs> Probably What Will You Be, Sarah Me. It's a, it's a story uh, based, my daughter is adopted from Korea. And the story is about the first birthday tradition in Korea of the Toljabi or the prophecy game. So that's dear to my heart because it connects me to my daughter. Okay. And uh, I, Greg Kappa, Chairman of the Santa Cruz Board of Supervisors, hereby honor Kathleen Avraham for all her service, time, and dedication to the County of Santa Cruz. I'll give it to you. Thank you there. so much. want to thank you so much and uh, it has been a deep and great honor to serve on the mental health advisory board and you have got a whippersnapper young bunch and they are amazing now so but i you'll be seeing more of me thank you so much uh, and real quick i'm going to tell everybody how we met uh, the first day uh my uh, twin daughters were born and they were very, uh, well, they were premature. So they were in the incubators at uh, 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 Dominican Hospital with my wife. They were one day old and uh, I found out I had a meeting with the um, 
a mental health advisory board. So anyway, I told my wife, uh, I'll take a little break and I'll come down. And when I got there, you handed me the uh, grand jury report. <laughs> and uh, we, uh, we, you said, uh, we gotta get to work on this. So anyway, that's uh, what we did. We went down a checklist and it took a while, but uh, uh, anyway, so uh, you and I met uh, when my uh, uh, little, uh, uh, twin daughters, uh, they're th almost four now. And I kept looking over at, at you and saying, Greg, are you sure you're okay? You <laughs> definitely look like a new dad. <laughs> Actually, I, I can't remember anything else about the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, thank you very much. And uh, comments from the public? Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner. I'm a resident of rural Aptos. I've had many experiences with um, crises with both neighbors and within my own family. And um, it's always so valuable to have people from the trenches helping improve this system. And I really wanna thank you all for your good hard work. It makes a huge difference in the community. And I would like to um, see perhaps more gardens and small animal therapy incorporated into our, um, our treatment facilities or respite places. Um, having seen the homeless garden project and the tremendous therapeutic value of gardening. And within my own family, the comfort of a small animal that one takes care of and uh, that the person in crises can relate to and calm down with really helps a lot. So I know that's a big ask, <laughs> but I think that it would help a lot of people if it can be provided in any of our programs. Thank you very much for your hard work. I appreciate you very much. You bet, thank you. Uh, Eric, uh, would you like to say something? Uh, uh, you've been a big part of the uh, success of everything. I wanna echo the comments from the board of supervisors. I've really appreciated the dedication and hard work of this mental health advisory board. It has not always been this way. Um, when I first started with the county, we had a board that was really struggling to find its voice in the community. And through all of these new appointments to the board, having an energetic group of people who are passionate about the cause and being so active in the community to bring the message of the board out to other members of our community has just been a very rewarding experience for me too. I rely on them to counter a lot of the negative messages that we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, I just wanna again, thank them for all of their hard work and dedication. Thank you. Thank you. He also rides a really nice Indian scout. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you're right. Okay, uh, well, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Want to try to get it to we'll try to do one item. Chair Caput, uh, you, we have item number 10 if you'd like to do that, or if you want to take a five minute break, or we could do number 10 if you'd like to do that one. Okay, the 10 uh, what about five. number nine? That's going to take a little bit more time, I think. Right, okay, so we'll no, do number 10. No, there's Okay, let's There's do that. The, uh, the, the, and then uh, we'll do the fire presentations, here. right? I think we can do nine. I think we can do nine. Okay. Which one? Let's do, let's do nine. Nine? We can go ahead and do num number nine. Okay, number nine. Uh, public hearing to consider application 181586, a proposal for 11 unit residential subdivision located at 3300. Uh, Maplethorpe Lane and Soquel requiring lot line adjustment, planned unit development, subdivision, residential development, roadway, roadside exception permits to consider resolution adopted mitigated negative declaration in accordance with the California Environmental Quality Act. Take related actions. Thank you. 
Good morning. You tricked me. I thought you were going to a break there. Um, <laughs> okay. Be on your toes. I'll, I'll, try, I'll try to be, to be quick and keep, keep this brief. Um, as mentioned, this is an 11-unit subdivision. I'll start with a brief PowerPoint. Um, the subject property is located in the first district uh, near the boundary with the second district. It's off of Soquel Drive, uh, north of Highway 1, um, and it is accessed by Maplethorpe Lane as well as Mulberry Drive and Colleen Way. Subject property is approximately three and a half acres. It's uh, in, located in the R110 zone district and the urban low density residential general plan designation. The applicant proposes to transfer some land to adjacent parcels um, and that would result in 3.2 acres approximately of gross land area. I'll show you some slides of the site. The, as you can see in the, in the air photos and the, 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 the maps, that it has a flag portion that connects the bulk of the site to Maplethorpe Lane. And these photos show that gate in the foreground at the top photo is um, the access to the property. And then there's photos of looking at the two streets, uh, Maplethorpe um, and Colleen, that, uh, that go along that frontage. Uh, as, as noted, there's a, a longer access drive to get back into the site. And back in the site, the area had a cut pad for a former PG&E facility, which was later um, used uh, commercially for a greenhouse operation once PG&E had left and sold the site. And it is in this area where the development's proposed. So the greenhouses you're seeing in the lower photos are in the area of proposed development. Uh, at the back of the greenhouses, there's a slope. It's, it's not as noticeable in the photographs, but there is a cut slope. And then there is, in the lower photo, a meadow above that, and that is where one of the residences proposed uh, where there is an ability to put a driveway up in that location. Uh, as noted, this is located in the R110 zone district. Uh, this requires a 10,000 square foot minimum area per parcel, and the gross parcel area after the boundary adjustment is uh, just shy of 140,000 square feet. Uh, riparian corridor and buffer area would be deducted from that. And the applicant is proposing uh, 11 clustered residential lots in the lower portion of the site. Uh, lots one through 11 are all in that disturbed area. And then lot nine would be accessed by a driveway up into an area with, with, that is, with less trees. There's a, there's a lar large number of oak trees on this slope. And um, the applicant proposes, as, as mentioned, to demolish the existing greenhouses and construct this clustered residential subdivision and planned unit development. This results in 11 residential parcels and a common open space area for utilities, streets, and so forth. The planned unit development would allow the applicant to modify the site standards, and some of those modifications include having the individual lot sizes be less than 10,000 square feet, although um, there is, sorry, one more. Okay. Um, that this would also result in reduced interior setbacks where lots are closer to the street and to each other than would be in a standard subdivision. And it also allows, in the case of a couple of the smaller lots, an increase in the lot coverage and floor area ratio just because on that lot itself, um, it, would, it would cover more of the site than normal, but on the, the site as a whole, it complies with the standards for the zone district. The clustering of parcels um, in the existing disturbed areas of the site um, is to protect riparian resources in the oak woodland on the property, and it also preserves open space within the neighborhood. Uh, residences are proposed uh, to be two stories in height and between 1,400 and 2,300 square feet in size. These aren't going to be necessarily monster homes or excessively large homes. The goal, as the applicant will describe it, is to have um, homes that are more for the, the, the average homeowner, you know, so it's a mod 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 modest sized home. And the structure designs would be consistent with the architectural styles in the surrounding residential neighborhood. Uh, environmental review has been uh, completed for this item. Uh, it's resulted in a mitigated negative declaration, which includes mitigations to protect biotic resources. The Planning Commission heard this item at a noticed public hearing on December 11th, 2019, and the Commission recommended approval to your board with direction to staff to uh, evaluate the feasibility of deferring the development impact fees for the project. So we, we looked at our processes. There have been a couple other projects that have done this in one way or another. And um, your board does have the ability to defer fees. And in preparation for that, uh, in consultation with county council, um, a binding contract could be utilized to ensure the fees get paid if they're not um, paid at the recordation of the final map, which is when they, standard, when they would normally be paid. 
And staff has prepared on page 43 of your packet, subdivision condition V, Roman numeral VQ, and this is added and it would allow the deferral of the development impact fees to the building permit stage. So after the final map is recorded, but before the building permits for the project are issued. That's a good pop spot for us because we have a defined timeline where we, we, if we let it go past there to doing construction or, or, or removal of holds, it's possible we could miss it and not collect the fees and that we didn't feel that was appropriate. That would be done with a contract. So that is part of the staff recommendation for this item. Now, if your board decides you do not want to do fee deferral, you could obviously move to, to remove that. In summary, the plan unit development pr would provide benefits to the community in the form of additional open space and preservation of natural resources on the subject property while allowing construction of new housing units. Neighborhood benefits include connection of a continuous sidewalk at Maplethorpe and Colleen Way. As proposed in condition, this application is consistent with the county code and general plan, and we recommend that your board conduct a public hearing on this item, adopt the attached resolution, which adopts the mitigated negative declaration for the requirements of the California Environmental Quality Act, and that your board adopt the attached ordinance granting a planned unit development and approval of application 181586 as recommended by the planning commission. That concludes the staff presentation. Thank you. Uh, do we have any questions or comments from the board? Well, Chair, I'll just say that um, that uh, obviously this is a project that our staff has been looking at pretty closely. Uh, in addition to the uh, required pre-application meetings that the developers he held, uh, I held a number of community meetings with uh, the folks on Maplethorpe and Mulberry. Um, uh, from that, they identified uh, an issue that already existed that they felt would might be exacerbated, and that was the speed of traffic uh, as uh, people went downhill. Um, uh, working with uh, the developer, uh, he paid for the uh, $600 fee uh, so that neighbors could decide whether they wanted to go and do the uh, speed bumps. Uh, you know, as you know, that's a that's a fee that we charge neighborhoods to, to start the process. Then they got the the required signatures and uh, he has agreed to pay for the, the community portion of the speed bumps, which to me is the real community benefit, not the, uh, the open space is great. I don't consider that to be the, uh, the community benefit. That, would, that open space is required be through our riparian uh, uh, setback requirements. Uh, but I believe that, that the community benefit needs are being met by, um, by the addressing the speed issue, which is already in the community. I just have one other uh, 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 signage issue uh, when it comes to the construction uh, uh, when we make ready to make the motion, but I appreciate the work of staff, um, the neighborhood and the developer working together to address uh, something for the community that the neighborhood understood that this was a, a good development um, that uh, although it wasn't 10,000 square foot lots, that it was a reasonable development and uh, and just working out these details of something that already existed in the neighborhood was something that needed to be done. So uh, I appreciate the work of everyone involved. Okay. Uh, we'll have uh, questions or comments from the uh, public. Good morning, board and chairman. Uh, Excited to be here today and hopefully move this project forward through to the final map stage and then eventually to construction. Uh, I think it's a good project. I think it's uh, by clustering these units down where the greenhouses are and um, we're preserving, preserving certainly the riparian area, but also a much greater open space area and a large number of oaks that otherwise would have been jeopardized by a 10,000 square foot lot design. Uh, normally, you know, I pursue density bonuses in a lot of projects I do. This one I don't think is appropriate for that. I think because of the unique circumstance of this property, it's really not right for a density bonus. And I say that with some trepidation and, and reservation because I really think that is a good process. But I do think there are circumstances in this property which really don't warrant that kind of approach. I'd wanna, I do wanna say that I submitted this application in November of 2018. It's now 15 months after that submittal. Uh, I've been told by the final map processing section down in public works that it'll be up to another year to get the final map done. Um, now these are complicated processes and I absolutely appreciate the efforts of staff that they have made and will make to get this, this final map done. But 
this lengthy processing time is incredibly expensive in, in holding costs, in escalation of construction costs, and market risks, market changes. So I very much appreciate the staff recommendation to defer these costs. I had originally requested that they be deferred to the um, final on the building permit. Uh, I will say that whatever deferral I can get, I appreciate and uh, understand that the complex complexities and extending it all the way to the actual final, um, final permit pro or finaling of the building permit process is difficult. So I won't pursue that any further, but I do appreciate the deferral up to the point of the building permit. Um, so yeah, I'm fine with the uh, speed bumps and also the signage. I don't think that's been put into condition, but absolutely, we, uh, no one's gonna use Maplethorpe with construction trucks and loading vehicles. There's speed bumps, it's a small street, so we'll go up Mulberry and Colleen. So I thank you very much, and hopefully we can move this on to actually build this in maybe two years. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner, resident of Aptos. Um, I apologize, I missed part of your presentation. I was trying to research something in the back. So I did not hear if there will be um, a percentage of affordable units built inclusionary in this development. Um, I would like that clarified. As um, a member of the public who travels through this area, I do often see that there are traffic um, hazards at this intersection with SoCal Drive. And again, I'm not sure if that's being addressed. I'm happy to hear that uh, the developer is willing to put in um, the speed bumps to reduce the speed within the, the, the neighborhood. But what is being done to address the increase in traffic at that hazardous intersection of um, Maplethorpe coming on to SoCal Drive? Um, and how have the traffic studies been done to uh, assess that. I also have a question about uh, in seeing the street width, I, I always think of accessibility by uh, fire engines, emergency responders, um, when it is coupled with maybe on-street parking that could be a problem in, in these narrow sites. I do see in one area there is a turnaround uh, for an engine, but in one part of the development, an engine coming in would have to back out. And um, I wanna know that the uh, Central Fire District has in Aptos Silva, they're merging now, have, uh, have given this careful thought and have weighed in on this issue. Thank you very much. I'm glad the oak trees are being given good respect. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we'll bring it, uh, well, uh, you, you, well, I, th you I think, I think the answer is that there, the affordable unit is being no. built as part of, uh, of this. Um, Central Fire has reviewed this uh, carefully. Um, uh, just so uh, everyone knows, there's a lot of development going on in this neighborhood. Uh, we, there is uh, 13 units uh, right down on Soquel Drive, very close to here. One of our high density sites uh, on uh, the Erlac property on Cunnison Lane. Um, as soon as the Soquel Creek Water District uh, resolves uh, their water issues, well, that will finally get constructed. And we have a, a application in for the, uh, the uh, church property, um, uh, uh, Reverend Deb Johnson's uh, property uh, is gonna be a 94 unit uh, assisted care, memory care facility. So there's a lot going on here. As part of that, there'll be uh, some changes made to the street, the uh, uh, lighted crosswalks, uh, potentially some lights as we um, a, as we uh, look at all that development. Uh, but this one is not making a huge impact. This is, uh, um, uh, some of those other developments are making a much larger impact. Um, I'd like to move the uh, recommended actions and I'd like to make two changes. And I have them written down here, Ms. Galloway. So uh, uh, in current permit condition, uh, 0.2 regarding traffic calming improvements. I'd like it to read, shall be amended to read that traffic calming improvements shall include speed bumps as a requirement. Additional placement of raised center line bumps or armadillos may also be considered. 
Uh, also on item six, uh, which is prior to any site disturbance or construction, I'd like to add C, construction signage shall be installed at the corner of Maplethorpe and Mulberry, directing construction traffic to use county maintained road Mulberry Drive with a second sign at Colleen Way and Mulberry Drive, directing construction traffic to the project location. Um, this has been a request by the neighbors uh, and, I, and I have uh, checked it out uh, with uh, the <laughs> landowner uh, to, to make these, uh, um, make sure that this work doesn't impact the neighborhood unfairly. So that's my motion and I'll okay, share this so with you. Do we have a second? Second. Who do we have? You? Yeah, okay, Ryan. All right, uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? There is none. Thank you. And uh, should we skip to the firefighters presentation or what do you say? Yeah. Yes, uh, we'll come the up, firefighters uh, are ready to, to come in. So we'll call them in. All right. And then, so we'll do uh, item 10 after the break. We'll, we'll do the firefighters uh, yes. now and then uh, We'll have a break, a little reception, and we'll come back and do number yes. 10, then we'll do closed session. Yes. Okay. Uh, where am I? Presentation of awards, Santa Cruz County Fire Department Firefighters of the Year. Okay, sorry to keep you guys waiting. Nice year, sorry about that. Are we ready? The Board of Supervisors is extremely pleased to provide an opportunity to publicly recognize the County Fire Department. That's you, okay. <laughs> and uh, uh, the uh, County Fire Department Career Firefighter and Volunteer Firefighter of the Year uh, 2019. I would like to invite uh, Cody Ratley and Volunteer Firefighter Edison Rosas to step to the podium. Okay. Before I present the proclamations, uh, I would like to invite Counter County Fire Chief uh, Ian Larkin. Okay. And if you have a few words to say. Yes, thank you, uh, Chair Caput, members of the board, uh, Mr. Palacios. Um, it's an honor here to be before you today to present the uh, 2019 Santa Cruz County Volunteer Firefighter and Career Firefighter of the Year Award. This recognition is presented to a volunteer and a career member of the County Fire Department that, that is given above um, the call of duty while providing emergency response and services to the communities we serve. Um, today, um, the 2019 Volunteer Firefighter of the Year is Captain Edison Rosa, Rosas um, from Company 37 in Davenport. Edison has been a volunteer with the County Fire Department, Company 37 in Davenport for eight years. Edison has worked his way through the ranks to his current position as a captain. Uh, he has been resourceful in his efforts to recruit new volunteers for the County Fire Department. He commits countless hours to help train new and current uh, volunteer firefighters in obtaining the required and ongoing training um, to be, uh, that's mandated to be a volunteer firefighter. Edison has played an instrumental role in assisting with the Volunteer Basic Fire Academy that trains all of our new recruits into the county fire department. Um, and he also helps um, as an assistant instructor at that academy. Edison plays an active role in the coordination of the facility maintenance and repair at the Davenport Fire Station. In addition to his commitments to the county fire department to making it a better organization, Edison also works as a Cal Fire seasonal firefighter in our Santa Clara unit just to the east of us as a Helitac firefighter. He also works for the city of Santa Cruz in the Marine Rescue Division as a rescue swimmer. Edison has been able to use these skill sets to also help firefighters 
dollars better prepare and provide services to the community. And mind you, he does this all as a volunteer. Uh, it is my honor to present to you your 2019 Volunteer Firefighter of the Year, Edison Rosa. we recognize uh, public safety, I, uh, that's uh, a priority of, of mine. So you're uh, the big part of public safety for everybody in the county of Santa Cruz. And uh, I'll give the first proclamation. I won't read everything, it's pretty wordy, but uh, I did notice here uh, Edison Rosas. Uh, you grew up in uh, Peru. And how, uh, can you tell us a little bit about Peru? Yeah, uh, Peru is a beautiful country. You guys should all visit it. <laughs> if you guys get a chance. Edison Rosas, 2019 Volunteer Santa Cruz County Fire Department Volunteer Firefighter of the Year. Thank you very much. Yes, sure. Okay, for the 2019 Career Firefighter of the Year uh, is Captain Cody Ratley. Uh, Cody works at our borough fire station up in the Loma Prieta area. Uh, Cody has served Cal Fire for 12 years and the county fire department for five of that 12 years. He has worked in several of our stations here in Santa Cruz County, including Corlitas, Soquel, the Par Valley Fire Protection District, and currently his assignment at Burl. Uh, Cody has uh, provided excellent, exceptional leadership in his assignments, as well as fostering close working relationships with the county volunteers and the local fire agencies, which makes him a unique ambassador for Cal Fire and County Fire. Cody sets high standards for himself. His positive attitude and his professionalism resonates uh, with his supervisors and his peers. Cody has been instrumental in the completion of several of our Cal Fire and County Fire uh, projects over the last year, including the completion of a remodel model of our borough fire station kitchen and our headquarters uh, kitchen as well. Uh, as a lead member of the Santa Cruz County uh, Fire Department self contain breathing apparatus. Those are the packs we wear on our back. They're an important, integral part of the things we do. He keeps them operational and running uh, so that they uh, provide that protection for our responders. Um, he manages that program. Cody demonstrates a strong work ethic, a positive attitude, and a consistent willingness to go above and beyond uh, the expected uh, workload that is already put upon him. Uh, he is an integral member of the CAL FIRE uh, team as well as the Santa Cruz County Fire Department. It's my honor to present to you the 2019 Career Firefighter of the Year, Cody Ratley. I'd like to invite both you guys to, to the podium and just say a few words. Well, it's hard following Chief Larkin here. Um, I'm so honored and grateful to receive this award. I just want to thank uh, everyone that showed up. I want to thank uh, Santa Cruz County Fire and Cal Fire staff that's always supported me. I want to thank my wife and family for allowing me to pursue this career, even though I'm gone quite a bit. Uh, true honor to be up here. Thank you. I want to thank you guys for the honor. I'm truly humbled and needless to say, very honored to be up here and receive this award. Uh, I want to thank my, my family, my mom, my pops, my sister, my brother, my team, and everybody that was made this, made this possible today. Uh, this gentleman right here, believe it or not, he took a chance on hiring me and my brother 10, like eight, 10 years ago, eight, nine, sorry, bad math. Uh, thank you very much. And I'm very humbled. Thank you. Grateful. Would you like to say anything? Any, anybody from the family, you're welcome to. Okay, thank you. 
Chair, I will just uh, add that uh, I appreciate the hard work of both these gentlemen uh, and their ongoing work in the fire department, uh, county fire, Cal fire. You know, we just went out and asked the community to pay more money to support uh, our county fire system. And we were successful in that in, uh, in large part because of the good work that you do every day, all day, um, and represent uh, the county fire system um, and the hard work of both our volunteers and our, uh, and our uh, seasonal or regular fire uh, fighters. And I just appreciate the work that, that you do. Uh, and I think the community has said that they appreciate the work that you do by agreeing to tax themselves more to make sure that we have enough firefighters on each engine. So thank you for the work. Thank you for representing Santa Cruz County and be safe out there. Thank you, Chair. Congratulations to both of you. Um, you know, Captain Ratley brought up a point that I think isn't, isn't told enough that this really is a family uh, wide, it's a shared burden and responsibility. Um, so thank you to your wife and to your family to recognizing that in public safety, um, you know, a lot of times you are gone, many nights you're gone and they wonder and worry about what you're doing. Um, and uh, for those of us that have families and those of us that have worked in public safety, I recognize how that feels uh, moving forward. So I appreciate that, that this in many respects is, is an honor for both of you uh, for, for that, for committing to the community above self. Uh, you deserve all the praise that you're receiving. And to Captain Rosas to volunteer all this time, uh, you are the lifeblood and the foundation of what makes county uh, fire exist. Uh, without you, it wouldn't exist, literally. And, uh, but it's not just the, amount, the fact you're willing to volunteer, but the fact of how talented you are. You're giving your skills in a way to your community that many don't. Um, and we live in a very cynical time about a lot of things, including about public safety, people challenging this. And uh, it's both of you that I think give us that hope and that sense of knowing why it is that we do public service, why it is people like you uh, continue to do public safety and that, that representing a community and giving back to a community really does matter. Both of you deserve everything you get. Congratulations. That's all, that's all been said. Very well said. My utmost respect and admiration for what you do to keep us safe. I um, can't say enough about how much we uh, admire what, you, what you're doing, the time you put out, as you said, the commitment to your family. You don't know how long you're going to be away when, you, when you're gone. And, uh, and uh, it, it's just, um, you know, you're putting yourself on the front line. And we appreciate it very much. Thank you. And I can't offer more uh, eloquence than's already been said. Uh, I can offer that there's uh, food and reception on uh, the fifth floor <laughs> Redwood Conference Room and everyone's welcome uh, to join and celebrate. And thank you. Thank you for your service and thank you for the good work you do for our community. Uh, any quick comments from the public? If you could make it short, that'd be great. Then we could have the reception. Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner. Rural Aptos, um, I used to be a volunteer firefighter and I know that it's really important that your family support you and um, not only for responding to things, but all the countless hours of training <laughs> that are so critical. So I want to thank you all for your time and your dedication, both you and your families. And thank you for the good work that you do. Um, we all know that the volunteers are the heart and soul of our community. And when Cal Fire crews are out in other areas, it's the volunteers that really hold us together and hold us safely. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll have a, about a 15 minute break well, here. Chair, for might reception. I suggest that while they go to the, uh, the conference room and get the party started that we finish our last item of business. Okay. And then we can. Um, is that okay with uh, everybody? Then we can join them. What is, okay, that's fine. Uh, we'll, we'll join you uh, shortly. Okay, you go ahead and uh, we'll, we'll come to the reception. Uh, item number, what is this? We're on item 10. What number? Item, item 10. 10. 10. There we go. 
Uh, ordinance amending chapters 1.112, 1 1 1.13, 1.14, 7.128, 9.70, and 10.04, Santa uh, County Code to correct typographical errors, address organizational issues. Uh, Good morning, board. Uh, Jason Heath, County Council. Uh, this is the 13th uh, installment of the ordinance updates. I'm happy to report that we are about 90% done with volume one of the code. Uh, this one addresses our code compliance enforcement, some parks and some roads, and I hope to bring the rest of them to you over the next few months. I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, I'm okay. There was some, it was, it's a great, it's a great review of our code. There was some interesting parts about administrative uh, law practices that I enjoyed reading. So. Any comments? Move approval. The, okay, do we have comments from the public? No. <laughs> okay. Uh, we have a first, we have a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposition? There is none. And we'll have a 15 minute break and we'll come back and do closed session. And there's nothing to report from closed session. Oh, yeah. If anybody wants to comment on closed session, now would be the time. Uh, earlier would have been the oh, time oh, for at public comment. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> 